My name is John, and I have always been an avid hiker and camper. Growing up, I was taught everything you needed to know to survive in the woods. My father taught me how to shoot, hunt, and plenty of bushcraft. Recently, I had gotten into backpacking and I really enjoyed it. I would try to go with friends, but most of the time, I ventured solo so I could go on my own pace. After graduating college, I decided to go backpacking at a national park that I had always wanted to go to. In these Sierras, none other than Yosemite. So, after telling family where I was going and getting everything I needed to survive out there for a few weeks, I made my way. It's about a 10 hour drive, but I eventually made it. And my God, was this place beautiful. After a few days of hiking, everything went smoothly and I even saw a few deer. Got some good fish and was really enjoying the great outdoors. Things started getting weird after the first five days. Normally, the sound of bugs and little critters at night accompanied me. But there were moments where it was completely silent. Like absolutely no sound at all. What kind of spooked me was I would sometimes see weird lights in the distance. I thought they were other backpackers, but it didn't look like normal lights from flashlights. More like orbs or lights moving around. Another few days passed and I ran into another hiker. Her name was Sandy and she was a pretty girl, 22, just like me. We made small talk and she asked if she wanted to hike together since we were going the same route. I agreed. And we spent a few days hiking together as a matter of fact. That night, during a campfire, I asked her if she saw any strange lights at night, and she said that she thought she did but took it as a distant backpacker. I didn't press on about it and just went on with the night. The next day, we went our separate ways, since I decided I was going back to the lodge to stock up on supplies. I then made camp at the furthest campground near a family with a small child. This is where things got really, really weird. It was late. The family was going to bed, and I was hanging out by the campfire having myself a few beers. Later, the fire became basically embers. I didn't want to go to bed yet. So, I was just sitting outside enjoying the peaceful sounds of the night. When suddenly, it went quiet again. That same eerie quietness as before. And then I saw some movement by the family's camp. I couldn't really tell due to distance and the dark, but I heard a zipper being undone. I made the decision to shine my flashlight near their campsite. Normally, this would be rude, but something didn't feel right, and I could have sworn that I saw a figure of something near their tent. It couldn't have been the parents since I saw them go to bed with their child when my fire was dying down. Once my light got near the figure, I saw something big. Like a bear, but it didn't look like a normal bear. And then as I moved the light right to the tent, it had the child in its arm and darted out of the campsite so fast. Faster than anything that size could move. I was shot, but I got my composure together really quick and I blew my survival whistle. Tent lights began to turn on from nearby, and the family woke up. And what I could tell was a panic. Where is he? Referring to their child. 
I yelled that someone abducted him, and I joined them to go alert the park ranger. A search and rescue were immediately started. I don't know if they ever found the kid or not. All I did was give my side of the story, and once I was cleared, I went back to my travels. I mean, I was getting tired when this happened, so it could have been a bear. But the way that it had that kid in its arm, bears don't do that to people. I quickly left that area the following day, and though it was really hard for me, I hoped the best for the family. This next story really creeped me out, not to the point where I ended my trip, but really made me question if I should continue on. It was a late dusk. I was fishing near a river, hoping to get a few fish for dinner. Then, at the corner of my eye, I saw across the river those same lights in the sky, but they were closer this time. I gazed back towards the river, and I kid you not, I saw what appeared to be two figures walking near the fire pit I made. They were skinny, about seven feet tall, and had really big hands and were making some sort of clicking sound. I noped the heck out of there, and decided I would camp elsewhere that night. Safe to say, I didn't sleep much that night. This is the last story I have on my trip that pretty much sealed the deal for me. Out of all the weird things I saw, this I can't explain. I ran into Sandy by sheer luck, asked her how she was, and if anything weird has happened since we went our separate ways. She said no, and was kind of worried about my question, and asked me what I meant by weird. I told her about the family with the missing child, and she had the face of someone who just heard their family member got cancer. I didn't mention the entities by the river, as I didn't want to frighten her. She said that her friend Emily had been backpacking and they were going to the top of some dome and asked if I wanted to join. I agreed, and we made our way to hike that day to the top of this dome peak. After a night of having a few drinks and good conversation, we all went to bed. In the middle of the night, I had to pee really bad, so I unzipped my tent. I got out and did my business, and right as I made my way back, I saw Emily just standing by the cliff looking out. I asked her what the heck she was doing and it was so late. She didn't say anything but I have to go. I told her, go where? It's late, you should really go to bed and don't get too close to the edge, you're going to fall off. She only responded, I'm okay. Be back to bed soon. I found this whole conversation odd, but decided to just go back to bed. In the morning, I was awoken by Sandy. She was in a panicked tone and said, John, where is Emily? I said, She's not in her tent. Maybe she went to look at the view. She was out last night doing that. But when we looked, she wasn't there. We couldn't find any trace of her friend. We looked for an hour in the woods nearby, calling for her name, but there was no answer. We were about to call an SOS when we came back to our campsite and we saw Emily right by the same cliff that I saw her at last night. Sandy shouted, Emily, where did you go? We thought we lost you. Emily didn't respond. 
she looked like she was in a trance and began making her way closer to the edge of the cliff. Sandy said in a concerned voice, Emily, what are you doing? Uh, get back here, you're going too close to the... Right as she was at the edge, she broke out of her trance and turned her head to Sandy and back to her feet in a look of confusion. Emily said, What? Why am I outside my tent? She took a step back and turned to make her way back to us. Sandy spoke. What are you talking about, Emily? But after Emily took that first step back to us, she... I can't explain it other than one moment she was making her initial step to go back to our campsite, and the next, she was flung straight into the air like a rag doll by some unknown force. Emily screamed. Sandy screamed. Emily! I was in a state of shock, and then we heard a loud but distant thud. We didn't even bother to grab our gear. I just grabbed Sandy's hand and told her, We need to leave, now. Sandy was shot. Tears in her eyes, but I broke her out of her state of shock by telling her, Run! She managed to pull herself together, and we ran. We ran for what felt like hours, but eventually, we made it back to the lodge. The staff asked if everything was okay, and I just said, with barely any breath, Call the rangers! Our friend fell off a cliff! It's been a few days since then. Sandy and I spoke to the rangers and search and rescue personnel, and told them where Emily had fallen. At first, they thought that we could have had something to do with it, but given how far she fell off the cliff, or thrown, I should say, and us passing the polygraph test, we were cleared of suspicion. What was even more strange was the rangers immediately dropped their investigation and began to call in the FBI. The sheriff sat me down and asked me simply, Son, what really happened out there? I couldn't hold it in any longer. I told him what really happened, and when he asked Sandy if this was true, she agreed. The sheriff took a long sigh and said, Well, that's what I figured. No way anyone could have pushed you that far off the cliff, let alone other things we found. I said, what other things? He only replied with, That is none of your concern. The FBI will take over from here. I probably don't need to tell you this, but I highly advise you to call the rest of your trip off. We were let go and given a hotel for the night to stay at to gather our composure. But before leaving, I spoke to a search and rescue officer, and I asked them if they found Emily. He said they did, but it was strange. Having fallen off the cliff, one would think that they would find her body in such a way that it was clear they died from the fall. But he said they found her body, but that her eyes and tongue were completely gone. That's all that I could get out of him. The following day, Sandy and I exchanged contact info and went our separate ways. Before we left, she grabbed my hand and said, I'm really glad that I met you, John, and I'm sorry our trip had to end this way, but I'm glad we made it out alive. I won't forget you. Please be safe. She gave me a hug, kissed my cheek, and got in her car, and drove off. Since then, I've been doing a lot of reading on missing person cases, 
primarily missing 411, and realize that there is a huge surge of missing people in this national park, as well as others. The incident with Emily is very similar to a few cases that I have come across. I do still hike and backpack. Sometimes Sandy joins me too. Though even with my new perspective and safety measures, the way Emily was flung off that cliff in Yosemite, I don't think I will ever go back.